the title of my talk is um, Conceptual Reverse Engineering, Teleology and Concepts of God. Okay, uh, the plan for the talk um, is this. So there are two parts. Uh, the first part introduces the puzzle of how we can uh, know God. Um, I introduce an assumption that there has been a divine creation act. And then I proceed to conceptually analyze uh, the notion of practical agency. Um, I want to suggest that if there has been a, a divine creation act, then we can analyze what um, practical action and agency imply via a priori conceptual analysis. We can um, then extrapolate some properties that practical agency exemplifies from the human case, from human action to divine action, and suggest that such properties would seem to be uh, reasonably attributed to a divine actor and divine agent. I will talk a bit about those six projected uh, properties of agency. Then I will talk a bit three independent motivated metaphysical facts like causal closure. These have nothing to do with the argument of, of conceptual reverse engineering that I will be presenting, but there are facts, they are metaphysical facts that any theory of, of God or the nature of God should be taken into consideration. Now, the second part, I will introduce three um, concepts of God, theism, deism, and pantheism, and I will examine how these three concepts, concepts of God fare with regard to explaining on the one hand, the, the project properties of uh, practical agency as applied to divine agency. And on the other hand, the um, independently motivated metaphysical facts. And I'll try to draw some corollaries from that with regard to um, different concepts of God and those kind of desiderata we need to explain. I mean, the metaphysical facts and the properties of divine agency that I would be extrapolating um, from an analysis of practical agency. Um, okay. Finally, I will just reply to two objections very briefly. So um, here is a puzzle that I will be talking about. It's a puzzle about how we can know God. It's a central problem in religious epistemology. Um, if uh, some God of some sort exists, how we can know his or her or it through nature. Uh, of course, if God exists, but we know nothing about his or her true nature, or in substantial little, then in explanatory terms, it would be good for nothing. I mean, if we don't know much about God, then we can't use uh, the notion of God to explain um, certain desiderata or data or whatever. Now, the problem is that um, this central problem of religious epistemology is a problem because given divine hiddenness and religious disagreement, a vast variety of religious traditions and a garden variety of divine revelations by different religions like Christianity and Islam. Uh, the question that comes to the surface is whether we can have any reasonable hope of some, some access to the true nature of God. I mean, it's not that we've come across God, uh, it seems to be hiding. And of course, there is so much religious disagreement between um, people, which is very hard to. Um, get a grip on what uh, God's nature could be. Assuming that God exists, of course, which is an assumption for the sake of um, the argument today. Although at some point we'll be wondering whether the whole debate um, backfires. Um, um, so I will, I will be arguing that if there has been a divine creation, then we can build on such a divine act to conceptually reverse engineer the possible nature of God by constructing possible models of the nature of God and by comparing them for explanatory power and other theoretical virtues. And I think this is a way of approaching the puzzle of religious epistemology of how we can know the nature of God. Okay, and we can in principle have some progress or maybe I'm optimistic, I don't know. Now, the whole discussion will rest on an assumption. The assumption is that there has been a divine creation act so we take it as an assumption uh, for the sake of the argument that somehow a certain God created uh, the physical universe. There was a first divine creation act. There was a divine creation act, the first moment of the universe coming into existence. 
And let's assume that this is true or is plausible and there, um, there might be a good argument for that. But uh, I don't want to um, delve into the question here. Perhaps as some people argue, a version of the Kalam cosmological argument is plausible in accord with the Big Bang theory in cosmology. Um, you know, the Kalam cosmological argument um, very roughly it says that everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. We have empirical evidence uh, from that that supports Big Bang theory. Um, the only thing that could be the, um, the first cause of that Big Bang is God, therefore God exists, something like that. And no matter uh, what is the argument behind the, um, the assumption that there has been divine creation, let's assume for the sake of the argument, such a divine creation act. Now with divine creation, I mean that God, a supernatural being or a certain um, being, person maybe, or impersonal entity, somehow creates the physical universe. And I say somehow with a question mark, because of course there is a big question how, if God is transcendent, immaterial, can create, um, and non-physical, can create something physical, the physical universe. But suppose that somehow this can be resolved. It of course depends on how we understand the nature of God, whether it's transcendent or immanent, which is actually the, uh, the topic of debate uh, today. But suppose somehow some God creates the physical universe and there has been a divine creation act. And there could be, I think, at least three different conceptions of such a divine creation act. So perhaps God creates ex nihilo the universe from nothing, as perhaps is the case in Bible, in Genesis, although I'm not a theologian, I don't know. Um, or perhaps um, there is already existing matter and God perhaps creates the universe by restructuring and ordering the matter as it is in a previous state of chaos, as in the demiurge God in Plato's Timaeus, or even perhaps there is matter, is structure, but it's somehow frozen in time. And uh, what God does is to set things in motion and provide, let's say, energy or force, and the causal chain just uh, uh, starts to roll out, as in Aristotle's first unmoved mover in metaphysics. These are three different concepts of divine creation. Um, but whatever is true, um, one of those three or some other concept of divine creation, we, we are just assuming here that there has been a divine creation act by some sort of God somehow. It's a very, um, it's a very minimal assumption, I think. And I think it can be useful for uh, subsequent debate. Um, okay, now, um, the thing is that if there has been a divine creation act, then there has been a divine action. And we know that uh, action is subject to a priori constraints. I mean, there are certain constraints with regard to action. And we can, we can derive those constraints from the very notion of agency um, and action, practical action via a priori conceptual analysis. analysis. So for instance, um, intentional creation of something is intentional action, of course, and intentional action is carried out by rational agents. It is agents that have um, agents that have uh, reason and reasoning that have intentions and proceed to act according to their intentions. When we have intentions, we have intentions for the sake of a goal, and of course, we can reason and support. Um, uh, why we tend to have that goal and so on and so forth. So there is a certain um, relatively easy conceptual analysis of what practical agency can uh, imply. Of course, rational agents that intentionally create things and um, intentionally act, and they have reasons for those actions are constrained in virtue of rationality by requirements of rationality. And with requirements of rationality, I mean, norms that we should abide by in so far as we are rational agents. For example, one requirement of rationality or, or practically rational action or agency is that uh, action must, intentional action must be purposeful. There has to be a goal that we aim to promote or achieve or fulfill. Um, for example, if I buy a beer, that's because I want to quench my thirst. 
if I want to uh, go to universities because I want to get a degree and uh, be educated or find a better job or something of the sort. But it just seems that in so far as there is intentional action, there are constraints or requirements of rationality that apply to uh, such action as for example, uh, purposefulness or teleology. Okay. Um, note now the web of conceptual connections between intentional creation, intentional action, rational agency, reasons and requirements of rationality. So intentional creation entails that there has been intentional action. And if we are talking about at least humanly intentional action, we are talking about Rational agency, some rational agent intended the action. And the, the, the agent, in so far as she is rational, she must have, have had reasons for that and should have conformed to certain requirements of rationality. Like, as I said, purposefulness. There, has, there must have been a goal and uh, we tended um, to promote that goal or achieve that, or achieve that goal. And that's why we acted in the way we did. I take these truths about uh, agency, practical agency and rationality and, and action to be somehow a priori necessary truths. Indeed, I think they are conceptual truths that somehow follow from an analysis of uh, rational agency and human action. And I don't think they are merely a priori synthetic truths. I think there are, there are analytic connections between the concepts. But of course, I, I cannot defend this here. And um, um, I can just say that um, take it for granted that there are a priori necessary truths about rational practical agency. Okay. Now, the fact that there are a priori constraints of practically rational agency, I think is important because we can use such constraints or requirements to extrapolate by analogy the nature of a divine creator. Recall that we, we assume that there has been um, a first act by a divine agent, a creation act, so we, we know at least on the assumption that there has been a divine creation act. And we also know via a priori uh, conceptual analysis that there are constraints and requirements on uh, practical agency. If that's the case, then we can uh, reverse engineer in some sense what kind of thought would create um, a universe. And we can conceptually reverse engineer the possible uh, nature of God, at least of a God that is a creator. Okay. Of course, the analogy between human rational agency and divine rational agency is kind of imperfect because uh, humans are, of course, not fully rational agents, while God is supposed to be a fully rational agent according to the classical definition of Anselm uh, as God, the greatest conceivable being, which is fully perfect, uh, morally perfect, uh, omnipotent, omniscient, and ideally rational. But in any case, the kind of, of argument we're trying to run is an argument from analogy, from knowing other minds of characters uh, in the case of God. I mean, we can judge an agent, I guess, by seeing how he acts, and then we can reverse engineer what kind of person or character or agent can do such a kind of act, like creating a universe. I mean, suppose I see someone, I don't know, kicking a cat and he's sober, he's not, I don't know, drunk or drugged or whatever. I think the, the inference is that probably is a very bad person. I mean, he's a sadistic person that enjoys causing pain to uh, helpless um, sentient beings like animals. So something like that is the idea that is driving the argument here and the analogy between human action and divine action. So we want to conceptually reverse engineer what kind of agent, if, if it is an agent, as we will see in the process, that would create um, a physical universe. Okay. Um, now, the very thing that um, we have assumed that there has been a divine creation act and we have conceptually analyzed uh, the notion of agency and action, and we have uh, derived some sort of a priori constraints and requirements of practical rationality, I think provide, provide a grip on what, what could be given a divine creation act. 
which is an otherwise rather vague and mysterious concept given divine hiddenness. And um, I think it could help us, as I said, get a grip on the possible nature of God and we can construct different models of the possible nature of God and can, we can compare them for explanatory power and have an attractive argument for the most plausible uh, conception of the nature of God. Of course, others would say that I'm groping in the dark for non-existent fictitious God, but recall the assumption of divine creation, which just the whole argument is conditional. And of course, as a conditional argument, I mean, it could lead to a reductio ad absurdum that might force us to rethink the very assumption we started with the divine creation act. Okay, and perhaps even the very uh, uh, the very existence of God itself. Okay, now let us see what other a priori constraints requirements of rationality would in principle apply to a practically rational divine creator. As you recall, we only talked a bit about uh, teleology or purposefulness, but in so far as we are intentional, rational actors or agents, uh, we act for the sake of goals, for a telos that we seek to satisfy or fulfill. Um, okay, now let us expand the analogy with human action. As I said, uh, I buy a beer because I want to quench my thirst, and that suggests some sort of um, teleology or purposefulness in human acting. But it's not just that, right? So um, let us start with an example. Um, suppose I'm a student and I raise my hand in class because I want to speak. You see the goal of speaking. What does this act imply? I think it implies at least six properties of practical agency. The first is intentionality. Well, it was my intention to raise my hand. And it was my voluntary uncoerced intention. No one forced me or threatened me. So the second property is voluntariness. The third property is teleology. I raise my hand in order to speak. The fourth property is what we call instrumentality or instrumental rationality. I thought that raising my hand was the best way to um, allow myself to speak in class. The fifth one is morality. It wasn't just that uh, I raised my hand uh, because I thought it's the best way to speak. I also thought that is the is the best way to allow myself to speak, given moral norms of civility and respect. I could have heckled or shouted in class, but that would have been morally inappropriate. And six, providence. My intention to speak remained unchanged because it was my plan to speak. I cared about speaking. This is why I kept my hand up until noticed. So my um, the intention has a certain sense of stability and we stick to the plan and we provide and care for um, the eventual, let's say, fulfillment of the plan. That's what I call providence. Now, if we turn now to divine action and we um, try to extrapolate those properties in the case of divine action, in, in particular divine creation act, and we just assume that it happened. Again, I think we can have the same six properties of practical agency, although in this case it's divine agency, it's not human agency. Of course, divine agency is supposed to be perfect, fully rational, um, unlike us, people, humans that are passionate beings, subject to vices and biases. But I think the analogy, um, in so far as an agent, human agent is rational, is good enough to support um, the kind of extrapolation of the properties of practical agency to the case of divine practical agency. So again, suppose that God creates, a certain God creates somehow um, a physical universe. Now, what kind of properties would we attribute to the agent again? Again, it just seems that as in the case of raising my hand, a human action, we would talk about intentionality. So the act was intentional in so far as they, the, uh, God is an agent. A rational, a fully indeed rational agent. It was voluntary. I mean, no one coerced or forced God to create the universe. That would have been possible given omnipotence. Teleology, it was done for the sake of some telos or goal. Um, some theologians talk about exalting human beings, I don't know, sharing God's love and grace uh, for the sake of glorifying God and so on. That's pretty much, I think, a theological question. 
fourth, instrumentality. So what created the universe by creating the universe code was actually using the best way to achieve the goal. I don't know, um, glorifying himself. Morality, creating the universe was the best way to promote a goal, morally speaking. So in Leibnizian spirit, that would mean that our world is the best possible world, um, morally speaking and otherwise. Six, providence, the divine intention to create the universe in order to serve God, God's goal remain a change because it was God's uh, general plan. God cares and provides perhaps via miraculous interventions or via revelations uh, for achieving the goal of creation and fulfilling her plan, whatever that is. So God um, could in principle intervene in the uh, human or the physical scheme of things in order to uh, guide or orchestrate things toward its own um, goal. Okay. That's pretty much the analogy between divine action and human action, given the a priori constraints of um, practical agency. Okay, now, um, there are also uh, independently motivated metaphysical facts that any theory of the nature of God uh, should take into account. Um, there are at least three basic such metaphysical facts. Um, there are Maybe there are others like consciousness or free will, but I will only talk about the causal closure of the physical. That is the idea that the physical effect has a sufficient physical cause. So whatever happens, whatever physical happens has a sufficient physical cause, which is to say that uh, we don't need a non-physical cause to explain things. Um, it could be the case there are, that there are non-physical causes, but in so far as there are sufficient physical causes, those non-physical causes are uh, superfluous. We don't need them. We can just uh, use Occam, Occam's razor and erase them and deflate our, our ontology, let's say. The second uh, independently motivated metaphysical fact is the necessity of the laws of nature. So we know from physics and chemistry that the laws of nature just appear to hold of necessity. Um, um, it's not a contingent matter, they just hold time and again, and they, their necessity doesn't seem to be up to us in some sense. And of course, both the causal closure of physical and the necessity of the laws of nature are two metaphysical facts that are uh, supported by the the, the, the great success of empirical science, especially in uh, the natural sciences. Um, natural sciences just seem to assume that there are necessary laws of nature and there is causal closure of the physical. Um, the third metaphysical fact is a fact about uh, morality. I mean, it's just a fact that there is a lot of evil in the world, both more, more like genocides and wars and killings and physical evil like uh, diseases and earthquakes and tsunamis and so on. So there is little doubt that there is um, lots of evil in the world. Now, any theory of reality that includes a kind of um, um, divine creator God needs to account for these three metaphysical facts um, as well in some way. Of course, these three metaphysical facts are prima facie, I think, plausible. Um, they are empirically supported. I mean, the, the problem of evil is well attested. Almost everybody will say that uh, they have experienced evil at least once in their lives. Empirical scientists will just assume that uh, there are sufficient physical causes of physical effects. Um, there are laws of nature that are necessary, non-contingent and non up to us in some sense. But these are prima facie plausible metaphysical facts. I mean, you can find philosophers who uh, they are, um, and sometimes they do uh, question these metaphysical facts. For example, a human regularity theorist might explain away the apparent necessity of the laws of nature. Um, he might just say there is no necessity, it's just regularity. We just project the necessity in nature, but there's no such thing out there. Or a mind-body dualist like some Cartesian might deny causal closure and insist that there are non-physical mental causes of, of physical effects in the brain. 
But of course, uh, as I said, these three metaphysical facts just seem prima facie plausible. And any theory needs to either account for them by vindicating them or by debunking them. Either way, they have to be explained. OK. OK, now we have um, two sets of uh, desiderata for um, a theory of the nature of God. So we have, on the one hand, the analogy between divine and human agency and on the assumption of the divine creation act and on the a priori analysis of agency, we have extrapolated and derived six properties that um, God should have as an agent, an intentional uh, rational agent. And on the other hand, we have independently motivated uh, by empirical science and by uh, everyday human experience, uh, metaphysical facts that also need to be taken into account and any plausible theory of the nature of God, assuming that God exists, should take into account both sets of considerations. Now, um, and this is the second part of the talk, I will introduce rough stipulations of three conceptions of the nature of God. Um, classical theism, deism, and pantheism. And I will try in the process, see how these conceptions of the nature of God fare with these two sets of desiderata or um, facts that call for explanation. Okay. So I start with theism. Um, so according to theism, God is a transcendent perfect being who intentionally and voluntarily creates the universe, sets or creates the laws of nature in motion and cares, conserves and provides for it while having an ultimate goal and plan for the universe and of course, humans that are supposed to be part of the universe and usually are taken to be the ultimate goal of that creation, at least in Christian theology, maybe in monotheistic religions, at least. Um, um, Non-teleological deism. I say non-teleological because there could also be teleological conceptions of deism where God creates the universe. Uh, he has a certain ultimate goal for the universe and humans but um, doesn't care about how the universe unfolds, doesn't conserve and provide for it, um, and so on. But here I just focus on, uh, for simplicity of argument and presentation, on non-teleological deism. So according to this version of deism, um, God is, again, a transcendent perfect being who intentionally and voluntarily creates the universe, sets the laws of nature in motion, but does not care, conserve, and provide for it, it has no ultimate goal and plan for the universe. God doesn't give a dime about the universe. Okay. Pantheism, which I take to be standardly a kind of non-teleological conception of God. Now, God here is not transcendent, is immanent. Uh, it's an immanent being or entity or force or whatever that is one with the physical universe. And the physical universe necessarily emanates from the nature. So it's a kind of very Spinozist conception of uh, God. God does not conserve care and provide for the universe and has no ultimate goal or plan. So there is no teleology. And of course, God, given that it's identified with nature, the physical universe is not an agent at all and therefore cannot care about the universe. Um, it should be noted here that because in pantheism, God exists necessarily, it is eternal and it is one with the universe there could be no creation act, at least no ex nihilo creation. So the universe is not created by an independent transcendent God because the universe is one with God and God is immanent in some sense and eternal. Therefore, there is no um, um, creation act. So reality that includes God and universe, which are actually one, just exists as a matter of metaphysical brute fact. This is just how things are. Uh, let's put it that way. Okay. Now, let us compare how um, these three conceptions of code fare with regard to the projected properties of practical agency we extrapolated. And then we will see how they fare with regard to uh, the metaphysical facts, the three metaphysical facts. Now, um, the thing to notice here is that um, we take theism um, first. So according to theism, God created the universe intentionally, voluntarily, had a goal. So it accounts for intentionality, voluntariness, purposefulness. 
took the best means for achieving the goal he had by creating the universe. And according to classical theories, God is supposed to be uh, morally perfect, omnibenevolent. So he should be able to account for, um, um, for morality and providence as a property that we projected on God. But I have a question mark there because as we all know, there is a, a thorny problem for classical theism, the problem of evil. And of course, for, for God to uh, be moral, it needs somehow to provide an account uh, why God permits and allows for evil, given that he's a, a moral being. And of course, um, should be providing um, for the universe and the human beings that are part and parcel of the universe. And there is a question mark because it's actually controversial whether we can have a plausible theory of how God can plausibly exist alongside um, evil. Um, okay, that's why I have the question marks there. So it's not clear that God, classical God, things can account for the moral and provident aspects of uh, the projected properties of divine agency. Now, days again, can account for intentionality and voluntariness. Remember that in days God creates the universe intentionally out of its own uh, free will, has, ha has no goal about it, is non-teleological days. And because it has no goal, uh, we can't talk about taking the best means or instruments in achieving the goal. And of course, if God has no purpose, uh, he doesn't really care about uh, the universe and its fate and doesn't provide for it. So um, pantheism now, uh, it's a no across the board and easy. it's very easy to see why in pantheism there is no personal God that is somehow, somehow an agent. So it's not a God that intentionally, voluntarily, purposefully creates the universe, taking the best means to achieve his goal and provides and cares and morally about uh, the universe and uh, human beings. So it's a no across the board because um, we don't have a God that is an agent and these projected properties are properties of an agent. So it's easy to understand why pantheism does not fare very well with regard to those properties. Now, we, we have kind of the reverse picture with the, um, how these three conceptions of God fare with regard to the metaphysical facts. So uh, now this seems to be a no across the board. So, and I have a question mark after every um, a metaphysical fact like a cause of closure and natural necessity and ubiquity of evil for this because this does not seem to fit well or uh, to be coherent or naturally coherent with causal closure and natural necessity. Um, first of all, if there has been a divine creation act and God is non-physical, then there must have been some sort of violation of the, the causal closure of the natural and non-physical cause, God causing um, a physical effect, the creation of the physical universe. Um, natural necessity also seems to be um, violated. I mean, if we take it that God can intervene in the natural workings, um, the laws of nature in order to miraculously um, intervene or um, change, I don't know, some law for some reason, for the sake of some human being or whatever. It just seems that um, faith will have a problem account from, accounting for natural necessity, at least in, in light of the fact that God can intervene in the natural nexus, in the natural order of things that is governed by natural necessity. And of course, there is also the problem of evil. And it's very unclear how can uh, atheistic conception of God can account the, for the problem of evil. It's, as I said, it's a very big problem. Of course, there are theistic theodicies like appealing to free will or uh, soul building and so on. But it remains a problem for um, a theistic conception of God. So it just seems that theism fares very well with, with regard to the practical agency part of things, but it doesn't fare very well with the independently motivated metaphysical facts. Um, <clears throat> deism, 
Now, days can respect cause of closure and natural necessity. Um, well, at least it can respect cause of closure after the creation of the physical universe because there would need to be a first divine creation act. And if God is transcendent and non physical, there must have been um, a causal relation between a non physical God and the creation of the physical universe. But after that, I think it would have been respecting causal closure because we have a deistic concept of God and God does not intervene from the creation act and onwards. And of course, that would mean respecting um, the laws of nature as well and their necessity. No law of nature would be violated for, uh, I don't know, for some revelation or for some miraculous uh, intervention or whatever. Now, with regard to the, the problem of evil, I'm not sure what days would exactly say. Um, some days might just deny that there is uh, there are more properties and would say that evil is just what we, we don't like or goes against our desires or natural inclinations. So whenever something causes us pain or doesn't satisfy our basic desires, we tend to call it evil, but there is no metaphysically um, intrinsic property of morally good and evil out there, uh, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> it remains, I think it remains an open question. And it's the same, I think, with pantheism. So pantheism, again, I think it fares better with deism about cause of closure because there is no creation act. God is immanent. So there is no violation of cause of closure, not even about the very uh, moment of creation. It respects cause of closure, um, natural necessity, no law of nature is violated. God doesn't intervene, doesn't care at all. Um, is not an agent at all, as we said. And again, we have the problem of evil. Um, if we take some, at least, standard Spinoza's interpretations, um, in Spinoza, what is right or wrong has to do, as I said, with satisfying desires, our, um, um, our increasing of our strength or diminishing of our strength. But these are projected properties of our own human psychology is not that there are um, there is something evil or good out there in the fabric of the universe, let's say. Um, um, it's just uh, constructs of our psychology. So it's a kind of unrealist. That's all that there is in the question of evil um, for, spin for a standard reading of Spinoza, I would say, and a pantheist uh, conception of reality. Okay. Now, some observations of, uh, about this kind of uh, abductive um, comparison between the three conceptions of God with regard to the metaphysical facts and the projected properties of divine practical agency. As I said, one thing to be noticed is that um, theism and deism that seem to portray a more personal God seem to fare better with regard to the properties of divine agency, especially theism seems to be faring better even from deism. And this picture seems to vindicate the old idea. Uh, it's a kind of um, monotheistic idea that human beings are created, today we would say via Darwinian evolution in God's image. So God is fully rational, is a fully rational agent, is a person, and we are created in his image, although we are not fully rational, we are partly rational, but we are still agents, we are still person, and so on. But of course, this kind of analogy raises the kind of reverse concern that goes back to the pre-Socratic um, kind of religious skeptic, maybe uh, Xenophanes, who said that we create God in our image and that according to Voltaire, we need create God in our image. So the idea here is that we, we construct or imagine a certain kind of God and we construct it in our own image is fully rational. So we know that we're partly rational. We just imagine that God, if exists, should be fully rational. We just postulate a kind of agent, but it's not there actually, it's just a thromomorphic way of thinking. Um, so Voltaire said, for example, if God didn't exist, we would need to create him, presumably because the concept is practically useful. 
but not overall explanatory fruitful and we can use Occam's ontological razor to get rid of it. So what I'm trying to drive at here is that um, the projected properties of divine agency would tend to indicate the idea that we're created in God's image, but that's actually a double-edged sword because it can be used in the other direction. And we could argue that we just um, imagine or construct God in our own image and we just imagine him fully rational. Okay. Now, the metaphysical facts allow a God that is more and more impersonal. So it's more impersonal in the case of deism. So it creates the universe voluntarily, but doesn't have a goal, is not concerned, doesn't intervene. And it's even entirely impersonal in the case of pantheism. In the case of pantheism, God is not a person at all, is not an agent at all. Um, so we have a, um, a kind of reverse explanatory picture here. The, the, the pantheistic and deistic picture explain the metaphysical facts that seem more impersonal, while the theistic conception of God bears better with the more personal feature of, of God as an agent creator, let's say. Um, one thing to be noticed here is that once we start slipping down the hill from teleological classical theism to non-teleological deism, and from there to non-teleological pantheism, the corresponding concept of God becomes more and more revisionary with regard to classical theoretical intuitions about God. So with pre-theoretical intuitions about God, uh, I mean intuitions that pertain to classical theism and the Abrahamic monotheistic religions, um, where God is conceived as a kind of unique personage and fully rational, fully uh, omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, and so on. Okay. Um, we can also understand why many, uh, like Bale, a French philosopher of 17th century, Consider Spinoza described pantheism as a kind of Bale atheism. So many of um, 17th century philosophers like Bale thought that uh, Spinoza was essentially an atheist, but didn't say it explicitly. So he just bailed his atheism behind a kind of pantheistic picture, maybe because he was afraid to say it explicitly given the time he was living in and how dangerous would that be for his own safety. And the reason is that uh, the kind of pantheistic conception of God seems to be leaving nothing of substance uh, of the classical concept of God. It's just the, the corpse, let's say, of the concept of God uh, that is left. That we may naturally think that we'd better be atheists rather than the pantheists, um, or at least agnostics. I mean, if we find reason to, um, to like the pantheistic picture, given that, that it fares well with the metaphysical facts, then perhaps we should read our discussion so far about the divine creation act and projected properties of a divine agent as leading to a kind of reductive absurdum that supports questioning whether there ever was a divine creation act. And from there, of course, we can also perhaps question whether there is um, a God at all. Um, okay. Um, now, two objections and brief replies, and we are done. So the first objection is a kind of uh, worry about anthropomorphism. So in my argument, I relied on a certain kind of analogy between uh, human agency and uh, divine agency. And I said, we can extrapolate some sort of um, properties that even a divine agent like God would exemplify as a creator, you remember the, the six projected properties like intentionality, voluntariness, purposefulness, and so on. And this raises the worry that we just understand God or conceive God in terms of human agency. So maybe perhaps we are just being anthropomorphic here and we shouldn't trust our intuitions about the possible nature of God vis-a-vis -vis human um, agency. Of course, this worry goes back to the pre-Socratic Xenophanes who said that Mortals suppose that gods are born, wear their own clothes, and have a voice and body. Ethiopians say that their gods are snub nose and black. Thracians that theirs are blue eyed and red hair. And of course, in the same way, in Hollywood films, Jesus is often portrayed as blonde and blue eyed, something that would be, would have been, I think, statistically unlikely for a Middle Eastern. 
Now, what is my reply to the anthropomorphic objection? So I don't think that there are necessarily um, a kind of anthropomorphism in my kind of analogy. And that's because um, we have intuitions about the nature of God that can be our starting point for an inquiry into the nature of God. These intuitions can, of course, be misguided or unreliable in the end. But as in other forms of inquiry, they can be our natural starting point. Besides, indiscriminate skepticism about intuition is kind of epistemically self defeating and leads to radical skepticism. And if some intuitions, like, I don't know, moral intuitions or mathematical intuitions, um, are at least minimally reliable, why not religious ones uh, too? For example, Xenophanes has also said that one God greatest among gods and men, not at all like mortals in body or in thought. Um, so I think that this two line code um, portrays a more rational conception of God in the sense that it understands that there could be only one God, given that um, if God exists, it must be the greatest conceivable being. And if such a being exists, it shouldn't be like us in body or in thought, in some sense. Which seems to me that to pave the way for the Anselmian monotheistic conception of God on good philosophical grounds, or at least it has some reasons supporting those uh, intuitions about the possible nature or, or of a more rational conception of God. Okay, now the second objection is a kind of methodological, um, meta metaphysical kind of objection. So many people who are very naturalistic or empirically minded might have worries about doing analytic uh, philosophy of religion. So they might say, um, does an inquiry into the possible nature of God go against naturalistic anti-metaphysical scruples, such as of the logical positivists or of Queen and Hollies? So I'm kind of skeptical about uh, logical positivism or Queen and Hollies. So I don't find them very plausible. I can't say much here. Uh, what I can say is that uh, I have little sympathy for naturalistic anti-metaphysical metaphysics, you know, the self-defeat or desert landscape reductions metaphysics. I think a more plausible conception of philosophical methodology and ontological commitment is something like the abductive method that Williamson, David Lewis, and others have followed. And this is basically, basically the method where we build abductive explanations that purport to best explain the target phenomena intuitions, experience, beliefs, even if these phenomena are not directly empirically verifiable or confirmable. So we can postulate entities that would make us, uh, would allow us best explain um, the Ziverada or phenomena, um, even if such uh, phenomena are not directly empirically very verifiable. And this is a methodology that is, that is actually followed in subatomic physics about unobservable um, um, entities um, like subatomic particles. And of course, if such explanations are overall best when postulating non-natural entities or entities that are not reducible to um, naturalistic facts, then so be it. They are the, the best explanations overall. Therefore, they are justified in postulating non-natural entities. Um, okay, conclusion. Um, to make sense of reality and cut it at the joints, as it were, we need to postulate entities that can carry out the required explanatory work. If there is some evidence or argument that there has been a divine creation act, we can build on that to get a grip on the possible nature of a God whom creator. We can a priori analyze the requirements of practical agency and extrapolate the analogy to divine agency. We must also take into account independent metaphysical facts that should constrain an understanding of God. But via comparative abductive explanations, um, we can compare how different concepts of God fare with such requirements of practical agency and metaphysical facts, and those have progress on the possible nature of God, assuming it exists. Because as I said, the whole debate can account as a reductive absurdum, and we might divide and deny divine creation act and even the existence of God. Um, as we have seen, theism who portrays a personal God fares better with the requirements of practical agency, and theism and pantheism who portray a more and more impersonal God fare better with, with metaphysical facts, at least with the three presented ones. 
Our task, I think, in philosophy of religion is to develop different models of the possible nature of God and atheism and compare them and contrast them for explanatory power and other theoretical virtues.